In the name of Allah, most beloved, most merciful, I would like to welcome you to our uh, second afternoon uh, talk today, which is part of our Islamic Awareness Week. Um, our top, the topic for this um, talk today is: uh, Do you know? Do you really know um, uh, Islam? Uh, our guest speaker is Brother Shabir Ali from Canada. Uh, he holds a BA in Religious Studies from Lawrence University in Surrey, Ontario with a specialization in Biblical Literature and a, master, and a Master's in Religious Studies from the University of Toronto uh, with a specialization in Quranic exegesis. Uh, he is now in his fourth year in, of his PhD study, uh, studies uh, in Quranic exegesis at the University of Toronto. He is also the president of the uh, Islamic Information and Dawah Center International in Toronto where he functions as the Imam. Uh, he travels internationally to represent Islam in public lectures and interfaith dialogues, and also appears on a weekly television program uh, called Let the Quran Speak. Uh, the lecture will run for about 35 minutes, and after that we'll be having a uh, question and answer uh, session. And we'd like to give the priority for the non-Muslims who are attending, uh, if that's okay. And, uh, and then we have some lunch that you can all join in later on. So I'll hand you on to Brother Shagai. Thank you all very much for that nice round of applause. <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs> Sometimes we're not sure what to do in Islamic circles. Do you clap or do you say takbir or nothing? <laughs> anyway, let me begin as usual by praising our Creator and Fashioner and ascend, asking to send peace and blessings from, upon all of His prophets and messengers, especially the last of all of them, after whose name Muslims customarily say, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam which means peace and blessings of God be upon him. Uh, what do you really know about Islam? I had in mind to talk about some of the common misconceptions that people have about Islam, but just in case I miss anything, let me hear from you. What, what are some of the things that you hear from people and you say, <laughs> they really misunderstand Islam? Or, or what are some of the questions that you have in your own minds that you think need really to be clarified in the lecture uh, on this topic? Let me hear from you. Yes, sir. Uh, some say like it's been spread uh, by soul. Okay. And uh, some say, especially Christians, say that it's a copy of Christianity. Mm -hmm. And uh, it, 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 it doesn't have the originality. Uh, say again, it does not? Have the originality. In okay. Aspect. Many things are borrowed from Christianity and Judaism. Mm -hmm. Okay, and what else? Anyone else? What, what are some of the misconceptions that you hear about? I think you guys are well aware that everybody understands Islam very well, right? Probably <laughs> jihad is one. Jihad, okay. Okay. Oppression. Huh? Oppression of women? Is this spelled with two P's or one? Huh? <laughs> <laughs> At least we agree on that part, right? Uh, and it's not a U, it's an O. Yeah, okay. Oppression uh, of women. Huh? If I didn't write that part, somebody may think we mean women oppressing men. So, I think should be it all for that completely. Some of that happens to you know. Not my phone. I'm sure about that. So, what else? Anything else? 9-11. 9-11, okay. So we can say that 9-11 uh, figures in right there. It's not a, it's not a, a double knot, is it? It's a, a stroke like that. Okay, 9-11. So let's start with that and see how far we go. If anything if it pops up to your mind uh, later on, or pops into your mind, do let me know. Uh, two days ago, just yesterday, we were having a discussion with one of our lecturers. So, we, I think, so we were discussing this in the last situation that Africa will have practices now. If you don't enter the religion, you just chop your head off. I don't think there is no compulsion in religion. Mm. So I think some people have this kind of conception that this is not a force. People have to do it. 
Sure. Okay. So, yeah. Uh, but you, you want us to deal with it that way, apostasy? Okay. Let, let's uh, let's take those now and, and, and work with them. And uh, of course, I've got your notes there. So if I miss anything, we'll come back and, and make sure if we get them off. Is there one burning thing you repeat? You have to mention? Yes. Oh, uh, I don't know. But all, all the time, my friends they ask me about why is Prophet Muhammad peace upon him? He has a twelve wife. Oh, okay, okay. Well, um, cool. huh? Let's say polygamy in, in general. But uh, let's see if we have time. No, I have to stop you now because we won't have time. I'll take all your questions. We won't have time to answer. Very quickly, uh, is Islam an Arab religion? I put this one in because it seems to me that uh, this is a common uh, problem. People think that Islam is uh, specifically an Arab religion and they don't realize how international Islam is as, as a faith. But uh, some of that impression might be gotten because there are certain features of the Islamic faith that uh, reflect back on its beginnings, and its beginnings actually have something to do with Arabia. But uh, it, it has more ancient roots than most people realize. Somebody spoke about Islam possibly being barred from Judaism and Christianity. Well, the, the fact of the matter is that Islam does make its link with Judaism and Christianity. We'll spell that out in greater detail in a subsequent lecture. Watch for that later on. But uh, the Muslims believe that Abraham traveled from Ur in the Chaldeas. Well, we should, to put it more carefully, uh, the, according to the Bible, Abraham traveled from Ur in the Chaldeas, uh, somewhere uh, in, the, in the Mesopotamian Mesopotamian region. He went up to Haran, and then he descended into the land of Canaan. Uh, but uh, the Islamic tradition has it that Abraham not only traveled to his way to Egypt and come, came back, as the Bible says, but he also descended into the Arabian Peninsula. He went to Mecca, where he set up uh, the Kaaba, this uh, st structure uh, where Muslims gather for worship uh, in, in the pilgrimage annually. So uh, there is something about Arabia that is connected with, with Islam. Uh, the Arabic language, because the Quran was revealed in the Arabic language, and uh, the Arabic language came to be very central in the expression of the Muslim faith. We say things in Arabic. Uh, here is a formula of Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim, uh, written in, in beautiful calligraphy, because traditionally Muslims uh, shunned uh, images uh, because of the biblical prohibition against uh, uh, making images for, for God. So we can see that there is a connection with Judaism and Christianity. There is a connection with Abraham. Uh, Muslims believe that uh, the firstborn son of Abraham, Ishmael, is the forefather, is the forefather of uh, our prophet uh, Muhammad, and whom be peace. And so, uh, the expression of the Islamic faith here in Mecca is a fulfillment of the promise that was made to the prophet Abraham that his descendants will be numerous, and uh, specifically that uh, was confirmed in the case of Ishmael that he too will have uh, numerous descendants. And obviously, when God promises uh, any faith believer that his descendants will be numerous, uh, the, the idea is that they will be religious uh, people. It, it, it will make no sense to promise a religious person, you know, that all is going to be well with you, you're going to have a not large number of children, and then the children turn out to be devil worshippers or something. It, it doesn't make any much sense. So, the promise to Ishmael is that his descendants will be numerous. So, to this day, people gather to Mecca from all over the world, and uh, they were all basically uh, uh, dressed in simple garments, so they all looked uh, much the same. And this picture actually does make everybody look all the same, though not, not attended. Just it's a blurred image of everyone together. Um, for, uh, obviously, if I do this again, I should get a nicer picture of people gathering at Mina or, or at Arafat. But uh, that gives you an impression of the simplicity with which people come to uh, the pilgrimage. And, and that shows what Islam wants to achieve here. It is uh, a conglomeration of people from all over the world expressing the uh, international nature of the Islamic faith uh, and uh, the unity of the, the human brotherhood, uh, people being all descendants of the same um, ancestor, Adam. So Islam really has uh, gone out of uh, Arabia. I can't even find Arabia in the map here. It's here, Mecca is somewhere here, and Islam has now spread to all parts uh, of the world, and there's no place where Islam has not uh, reached. I don't know too much about the Antarctica, but uh, I know that the 10 Muslims there. <laughs> so, uh, do Muslims, uh, obviously in, in hindsight, I, um, um, I, I have made my images to um, overshadow some of my text, because in the last minute I, I did a change in the overall design. 
But uh, the question here is, do Muslims uh, uh, reject Jesus? And uh, the answer to that is no. Many people might think that, uh, just prima facie on the face of it, that only Christians believe in Jesus, everything other than Christians must reject Jesus. That might be a, a presupposition. Uh, because indeed, outside of Islam, I don't know of another religion that holds Jesus in such high esteem. Muslims actually do believe in Jesus. We believe on the strength of the Quranic revelation, which for us is the word of God, uh, that Jesus was born in a special way, that uh, he performed many miraculous deeds, including healing the blind, curing the leper, raising the dead back to life, and that uh, God eventually raised him to himself, and uh, it is a common Muslim belief that Jesus, in fact, will uh, return before the end of all time. Uh, so, outside of Christianity, I don't know of another faith, uh, any of the world's uh, religions, the major religions at least, that hold Jesus in such high esteem. There's only one other major religion that has something to say about Jesus, and all it says is negative, really. Uh, but uh, uh, Islam uh, holds Jesus in such high esteem. No wonder people look at it and say, oh, well, wait a minute, Islam must be a, a, a copycat of Christianity. But uh, we will see that Islam, in fact, has its own distinctive features, which uh, do, do not just simply show it to be a continuation of those uh, faiths, but also, a, in its own words, a correction uh, of uh, those faiths. Because the Quran says that it has come as a confirmation of the previous scriptures, musaddiqan, uh, uh, confirming, wa muhaiminan alayh, and also as a quality control uh, over the previous scriptures, the idea being that God has revealed messages throughout time through his prophets and messengers. Some of those messages came to be changed over time, and uh, the Quran now comes uh, to restore the original teachings the way it was. So there are affinities, and also uh, there are uh, some salient features uh, to be explored and understood. So in short, Muslims do in fact uh, believe in, in Jesus, very much so. Is Allah a different God? This is something we, we, we hear a lot. Perhaps you don't hear it that much, but I hear it a lot when I interact with people of other faiths and, and we get into dialogues. I can remember very distinctly, we were, we were engaged in the dialogue, we planned it very well, uh, the topic was selected, and we went to, in, to have it in, in, in the church where, of the pastor with whom I was having the dialogue. And he drew up a, a, a nice uh, placard in, in which he showed a contrast. Uh, so, on this side there's Bible, on that side there is Quran, uh, on this side there is Jesus, on that side there is Muhammad, on this side there is Allah, I'm uh, sorry, on this side there is God, on that side there is Allah, as if these are two different gods. Actually, we have to start with that as a common element, and then you can have distinctive features. And in fact, uh, when we think of the distinctive features, it's, it's not even Bible over there, not entirely, because Muslims uh, in, in fact accept that the Bible contains revelations, which were given to many of God's previous prophets. Of course, they have been kept to, with, with, with varying form of, or varying degrees of accuracy. Uh, but uh, in principle, we accept that all of the revelations from God should be believed, and all of the prophets of God should be believed. Uh, the Quran is the final expression of that which God has been revealed to his prophets, or has been revealing to his prophets over time. But uh, it is the same God. They, this word, in, in, this is a, a calligraphic representation of the word Allah in Arabic, which really means, uh, according to some etymologists, it means the God. Uh, they, they think that it is a combination of Al, which is a definite article in Arabic, and uh, the, um, the, the word for a God, which is Ila, in, in Arabic. So, uh, they think that over time people, uh, to say it more fluidly, just as we compress the words do not into don't uh, by leaving something out in the middle, uh, al ila came to be compressed as Allah over time. That's one theory. Nobody uh, knows, knows for sure, but that seems to be a good uh, a theory that has been accepted by many of the traditional commentators on, on the Muslim Quran. Uh, so in that case, we're speaking about the God. Uh, forget about all the other gods that people may think about, but there is conceptually only one real God who created everyone. That is the God that is called Allah in, in the Arabic. And uh, as we can see from, from what we've said before, uh, since Islam is so connected with Abraham, it is really the God of Abraham that is central to the Bible. 
Even in the New Testament, we have the disciples of Jesus expressing their faith in the God of our forefathers, the God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob. That is the only one true God. That is the Islamic message. There is no ilah except Allah. So this word uh, usually means God in, in the Arabic language. It can refer to anything that people worship and call God. But uh, from the Quranic perspective, there is only one God. And the one God now has a name. He is called Allah in the Arabic language. So Allah has become for Muslims the way of speaking of God. To the extent that uh, Muslims may be quite hesitant to use this term. Because this term and its English equivalent, just simply God, uh, may conjure in the minds of people a wide variety of images of gods and godlings and goddesses and so on. So when we say God, what do you mean? When we say um, Allah, what do you mean? So when we say Allah for Muslims, it is very clear we mean the one true God. When we say God, so people now are a little bit fuzzy. Do you mean Jesus? Do you mean his Father? Do you mean the Holy Spirit? Do you mean all three together? Uh, and, and so on. Uh, so to, to avoid confusion, Muslims generally prefer to just simply say Allah. But uh, of course, in order to communicate our message to others, it is important that we also use the term that people are familiar with. Otherwise, they may continue to get the impression from us that we are speaking about a different God. To continue then, uh, in the Bible, in fact, we have uh, the Ten Commandments. It's not obviously a, a real page from the Bible, it's just a representation uh, to convey the idea that the Bible contains uh, ten uh, commandments uh, that says thou shalt or thou shalt not, uh, up to ten. And uh, those are said to be given to Moses, uh, written by the hand of God or the finger of God on two stone tablets. And uh, the first two commandments really about having no other God but one God. And it is the same one God that uh, we, are, we are speaking about in the Islamic faith. So that's very central uh, to the teachings of the Bible. No, it is not a different God. Is Islam a violent religion? This is one of the questions that uh, you, you raised for me. And uh, to answer that, we have to really go into a history of the unfolding of Islam and of the Quran and to understand how um, uh, how Islam comes to be associated with uh, some degree of, of violence, and what is the place of violence, and uh, how is Islam to view peace. Uh, to understand this, we have to really go back to the history and look at the unfolding uh, of, of the Islamic faith. Realize that the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did not uh, receive his revelation of the Quran all at once. You, you recognize that. The Quran, as we have it now, is a collection of inspired messages given into the mind of the Prophet Muhammad over a period of 23 years, a little bit at a time. And the little bits actually comment on occasions and circumstances as they arise. So something is happening. There could be love and war and marriage. Uh, and, and all of these situations receive some kind of comment or instruction for the Muslims in the form of this Quranic revelation. Again, a bit of the time. <coughs> so uh, you have real situations. Somebody may be in the battlefield, and uh, the revelation comes to the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, about what's to be done in that situation. So what is said in the battlefield cannot be taken into a ball game. Because there are two different contexts. An army general might say to his, uh, to, to those under him, you know, go fight them, kill. But but that belongs in the battlefield. There is a there is a context, there is a situation in which he says that, and a good army general may actually say that, and he will come back as a hero and will give him some medals and so on because he fought so well and he guided them and uh, and, and and supervised his underlings uh, to victory. But but he cannot say the same thing at the ball game. So let's understand then how the Quran came to be revealed and had something to say about uh, peace and, and violence. The Prophet Muhammad uh, was uh, born in, in Mecca. I'm trying to see if I can add a blank slide here. and I, I don't see how I put oh, maybe here. Mm, no, there is no. We have that. I can do it later, but, but let's work with what we have for the, in the interest of time. Let me go back a bit and, and look at the... Um, the map of Abraham's journey that we, we had a chance to do previously. The Prophet Muhammad, uh, on whom the peace was born at Mecca, that was his hometown. And he began to preach Islam there for many years, from the year 610, for another ten, uh, 10 to 13 years. 
In those years, he was persecuted because the people of that uh, town, uh, they were pagans. They could not understand how God would resurrect uh, a, a dead person back to life. And worse than that, they could not understand how this man Muhammad is trying to make one God out of all the gods that they worship. They, they had 360 idols around the sacred mosque in, in Mecca. And they wanted to keep them there. But the Islamic message was saying there is only one true God. All these things that people are worshipping are, are worthless. Uh, and eventually these would be gotten rid of. But in the meantime, for the 13 years or so, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, is being persecuted in Mecca. So he migrates up north eventually to a place called Medina. Somewhere here. And that is where eventually he will uh, meet his... Uh, he will... Um, finally die and go back to meet his, his Lord. Now, the, it's after the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, migrates to Medina that he starts to get uh, messages that uh, will speak about his engagement in, in a military confrontation. For the last 13 years or so, the Muslims were being told to be at peace, to turn away from the ignorant, uh, to avoid them, and, and just say a word of peace to them. Uh, and, and so on. So there was a, a disengagement uh, with the enemy, and one might say that's partly because the Muslims had no power. But uh, if we understand the full scenario, we will see that it's not only because the Muslims had no power. Of course, if they had no power, that's taken for granted. They're not going to fight. It would, be, it would be silly. But that doesn't mean that when they have power, it is their policy to fight. It, it might be their policy to defend themselves if they are being attacked. And that, to me, is the correct uh, interpretation of what has happened. And we'll see the, how that interpretation is justified. So the, the Prophet Muhammad then migrated up to there, and then the battles came to be fought one after another. People came, uh, the, the non-Muslim forces from Mecca would march their way up some 450 kilometers up to Medina to go and attack the Muslims there. This is why you can find that the battles uh, that the sites of the major battles are actually around Medina. For example, you have the Battle of Badr. The Battle of Badr was fought at a place called Badr, hence its name, and Badr is very close to uh, Medina. The Battle of Uhud was fought actually at Uhud, which is almost on a small map like this, indistinguishable from Medina. And then the Battle of Khandaq, the Battle of the Trench, was fought, was fought again at uh, Medina, on the, on the northern side of uh, on the northern frontier of Medina. So let's uh, go back to my page, and, and you get the impression, just remember that, that these are the sites of the battle. The battles are not here, the battles are there. So that already tells you who is attacking whom. It, it, it is these folks down here that are marching up hundreds of kilometers to go and attack that city, and the people of that city are just coming out to meet them either here or sometimes closer to the city. In fact, it was getting increasingly closer to the city until the Battle of Khanda. So if I go back to where I have to face the right, I will just uh, quickly now try to retrace the, uh, the, the, the history of that. So the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, migrated. He left his hometown Mecca in the south. He went up north to Medina. What was he doing? He was leaving the scene of violence. That's where he and his people were being attacked. So it, it, he could not retaliate, obviously, because he had no power. But uh, also, as we'll see, because it's not his policy to fight. He migrates away. He leaves the scene of violence. He goes up north. In the first year after that, we have the Battle of Badr. The second year, we have Uhud. The fifth year, we have uh, Khandaq. Khandaq, which means trench. True? But it is also called by another name. What is it called? Huh? The Battle of Ahzab. The, the, uh, Ahzab. And what does Ahzab mean? Uh, groups or allies. Let's say allies. Such a large allied force had gathered in that year of non-Muslims wanting to attack the city of Medina that had they been successful, that would have been the end of Medina and uh, of, of the Muslims. So the Muslim faith would die then and there. But uh, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, practiced his defensive measure. 
he dug a trench on the northern path towards Medina, uh, knowing that this is the most likely route that uh, the non-Muslim armies would take. And when the armies came there, they could not cross the trench. They waited it up for three weeks, bearing the elements uh, of, of weather. And eventually, they could not handle it anymore. Uh, the Allied forces uh, disintegrated, and uh, they left the scene. And, and the Muslims were known to have withstood that uh, large Allied force. So now, the Muslims had some position of uh, relative strength, or at least some honor. The, the Prophet Muhammad then, peace be upon him, in the sixth year, set out to make the pilgrimage, a minor one, an Umrah, if you would say in the Arabic, right? So he set out to make the pilgrimage, the Umrah, and when he went close up to Mecca, where he's to make the pilgrimage, because the, the target of the pilgrimage is to go to the sacred house, which is there in Mecca. There he's prevented by the non-Muslims from entering uh, Mecca. And he makes a peace agreement with them, that there will be peace for 10 years. He won't be able to enter this year, but he'll be able to come back the following year, at which time they'll clear out the town and give him free pass so that he will come in, make his uh, pilgrimage, and go back without interacting with the locals. Why do they not want the Muslims to interact with the locals? Today we have a problem where we're thinking, okay, can Muslims integrate and so on. There is, a, there is a perception that Muslims don't want to interact with others. But, but there, the problem was that the others did not want the Muslims to interact with them. What was the problem? The others thought that if the Muslims interacted with them, with the locals, then the Muslims would influence the locals with their newfound faith. They didn't want this interaction. So the deal is, we're going to have peace for 10 years. You can't enter this year. You come back next year, we'll make the preparation for you. We will we'll clear the way so that you can come in peacefully, make your uh, pilgrimage, and return. So the Prophet Muhammad agreed to that. Uh, the, the document was drawn up uh, initially, reading that this is an agreement between Muhammad, the Messenger of God, and Suhail bin Amr, who represents uh, the Quraysh people of Mecca. But Suhail bin Amr said, I can't accept that the document reads that way. We, we don't accept you as the Messenger of God. And had we accepted you as the Messenger of God, we wouldn't be having this agreement to begin with. So you have to cross out messenger of God. Ali, the cousin of the Prophet uh, Muhammad, peace be upon him, who had uh, been writing the document, couldn't bear to cross out such a, a formula, which for him was a deeply held faith. The Prophet Muhammad himself, peace be upon him, said, okay, show me where it is. And he crossed it out, and he wrote son of Abdullah, which was his known surname, Muhammad, the son of Abdullah. The Muslims could not handle this. How do you have these one, this one-sided sort of an agreement? Furthermore, it was stipulated that if any, of the, of, if any new Muslim were to be reclaimed by his people of, uh, of Mecca, his family uh, in Mecca, he would have to be returned. But if any of the uh, Meccans, uh, sorry, if any of the Muslims were to come and join the Meccans, then they would not be returned. So you have, again, a one-sided kind of exchange. But the Prophet Muhammad agreed to all of these terms. Omar, who, was to, uh, who would eventually become the second caliph of Islam, actually protested, aren't you the messenger of God? And isn't Islam the truth? So why are you agreeing to all of these conditions? But the Prophet nevertheless calmed him down and, and agreed. The, the, the contract, the agreement was signed. Uh, on, on the return journey, a part of the Quran came to be revealed to the Prophet Muhammad. That is now the beginning of Surah 48. It says, Inna fatahna laka fatham mubina. We have given you a clear victory. So that wasn't a battle. It was a peace agreement. But this is called a victory in the Quran, in Surah 48, verse number 1. The chapter itself is called Surah al Fat, the, the chapter of the victory. And the commentators generally say that this is a reference to the Treaty of Badaibiyah. Now, in what sense did this turn out to be a victory? It only lasted for 17 months until the other side broke the treaty. But the Muslims were able to observe that in the 17 months of peace uh, following this covenant, more people embraced the religion of Islam than in the 17 years prior to that of all of the preaching of Islam. What was the difference? In, in peacetime, people listen to what you have to say. And if you have something reasonable to say, people will listen to it and say, oh, yeah, that makes sense. But in wartime, people don't have a chance to listen. The fight or flight mode kicks in. If they have the power, they fight you. If they don't, they take flight from you. Uh, so in the previous 17 years, that was the situation. People don't listen. In the 17 months of peace, people were listening. And more people entered the 
religion of Islam. That, in fact, paved the way and made it possible uh, such that in the eighth year, the, the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, entered Mecca, and that came to be known as the opening of Mecca or the Fat of Mecca. Meaning that it was now possible, Mecca was now opened up as a free territory so that the Muslims could come in and practice their faith there freely. That, that now became possible. When the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, came into Mecca, many of his old enemies thought that he would take revenge on them because if the Prophet Muhammad and his followers were persecuted for so many years without justification, they eventually had to leave their homes and all of their properties and so on and migrate away. Now they have come back victorious. What are they going to do? The Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, bowed his head and made the circumambulation of the sacred house, the way in which uh, the, we are told to, to worship in that area. And uh, he declared a general amnesty for those who would take shelter in, in, in certain locations, those who would take shelter in the sacred mosque, and those who would uh, go into the house of Abu Sufyan, which means that these people are not intent on fighting. And so he entered there into, into Mecca peacefully, though he was victorious. So that shows that the, the whole policy and, uh, and principle uh, of the Islamic message. The Islamic message is really about peace, and in every way possible, Muslims should be uh, working towards peace, as the Prophet Muhammad, uh, peace be upon him himself, did. People misunderstand because uh, there, there is a verse in the Quran, in Surah 9, verse number 5, and some other verses as well, but particularly that one, which uh, says, kill them wherever you find them. Now, if the words are taken out of the context of the page in which it is written, and out of this historical context that we have just described, then this sounds terrible. I agree to that. Uh, but it's almost like the general's words taken from the battlefield and now put uh, in, in the midst of the ball game. It doesn't seem to work. But when one reads that passage in, in this historical context, and in the context of the page in which it is written, uh, you will see a different story emerging. First of all, that passage came to be revealed in the ninth year. In the ninth year. That's when we have Surah 9, coincidentally, the Surah 9 is in the ninth year, Surah al uh, What was happening at the time? After the eighth year, when the Prophet Muhammad had already made the opening of Mecca to establish peace in the land, there are still elements who are willing to attack the Muslims. I uh, think they're obviously ambushing the Muslims and ready to kill the Muslims wherever they find the Muslims. The Quranic principle is that whoever is oppressing you in this way, you can respond and retaliate to the extent of that oppression. Because, but you cannot exceed that in Allah, Allah yuhibbul mu'tadeen, because God does not like those who are excessive or those who uh, are oppressive. But you can respond in, in like manner to, to that sort of thing which you're doing. So when this uh, verse is saying that uh, you should waylay them and besiege them and kill them wherever you find them, that's because it's a retaliation uh, and, and a response to a justified response to uh, the kinds of attacks that they're launching against the, the Muslims. So that's in the ninth year after peace has been established and some people, some elements are there breaching that peace and the Muslims are now told not only to defend themselves but to resist those uh, terrorists in order to establish uh, the peace for everyone. What, is, what else does that passage say though? That passage begins by, by declaring an, a, a freedom for, of responsibility uh, from, from, with regards to these people who are attacking the Muslims. And it makes an exception. It says, except those who have made a covenant with the Muslims and they have kept their covenant. So as long as they're true to the covenant, Muslims have to also be true to the covenant. That's all of that is said in the, in the verses which preceded it, preceded this. So it's, it might be taken by itself and, and made to look like it is a, an absolute commandment without any stipulations and, and conditions. But when we read the whole passage together, you see that there are conditions and stipulations and exceptions. There are certain people that you cannot attack that you cannot fight against because obviously they're not fighting against you. And the Quranic principle is You fight in the way of God against those who are attacking you, but you do not be excessive or, or oppressive, or you do not uh, initiate hostilities according to one translator. Uh, then, what comes after the verse? If that is Surah 9, verse number 5, that, that is uh, now uh, being discussed so widely, what, what is verse number six? 
Verse number six says that if uh, one of these uh, non-Muslims were to seek refuge with you, then you are to give him refuge. فَأَجِرْهُ حَتَّى يَسْمَعَ كَلَامَ اللَّهِ So that he could hear the words of Allah. ثُمَّ أَبْلِغْهُ مَأْمَنَ Then you are to transport him to his place of safety. You see the last part? The Muslims are then obligated that if there's a non-Muslim among them who had sought refuge with them, that they're, they're first give them refuge, and when they're ready to leave, the Muslims are to make sure that these persons reach a place where they will be safe. So what do you think then of the beheadings that we um, hear about on, on the internet? Obviously that's a, a, a distortion of the Islamic message. That cannot be Islamic. So whatever political interest, whatever is, is bugging some people, whatever beefs they have, and, uh, and uh, whatever they're fighting for, uh, they, they, their method cannot be Islamic, this kind of method, because it's very clear that uh, Muslims have to respect the sanctity of life. Sure, there is a place for entering into battle, but then that's a battle between soldiers. It doesn't involve the women and children. Muslims are specifically told uh, in the prophetic traditions that they are not to kill the women and the children and the elderly. In, in fact, they are not to harm any non-combatants, including those people who are monks and their hermits. They are they're concerned with their religious observance. They are not uh, interested in politics and they are not fighting over land or property. They are not uh, they're attacking any Muslim. So they have to be kept safe. So uh, it, it is very clear then that uh, things might be distorted if we take them outside of this history and outside of the page in which uh, the passage is, is written. And we should be careful then to put everything back into its place and understand what the jihad or what the uh, struggle is uh, really about. It's not uh, then um, true to say that Islam is a violent uh, religion. Finally, does Islam uh, demean women? I have to be very brief with this because I need to get to your questions and some of you may have classes to attend and so on. So, very quickly, the answer to that, obviously, you can anticipate is no. But it's not only because I'm a Muslim that I want to say no and I'll just say no. But uh, when we look at what the Quran says about women and their relationship to men, we see that the Quran actually advanced the rights of women far beyond what uh, they were at the time and far beyond what they will become for many centuries in many different parts of the world. Uh, today, women uh, enjoy many rights uh, in, in many of the developed countries. But if you look back at the history, we'll see that uh, about 100 years ago, many of the rights that women now enjoy were, were not enjoyed uh, in, in France and in, in, uh, in many parts of Europe. Uh, how, how long would the women get the, the right to vote, for example? It's not more than 100 years ago in, in many of the developed uh, um, countries. But we'll see that in the Islamic tradition, women already had a say in community affairs and in politics. Uh, the wife of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, Aisha, actually led a contingent to demand a certain right. Uh, there was a dispute between Muslims, and uh, it's not for us now to say who was right and who was wrong. But the fact that Aisha, radiallahu anha, could, uh, the mother of the believers, could lead a contingent shows that it was acceptable in the Muslim society that uh, a, a woman can be in charge of, uh, of something uh, so momentous. Uh, more than this, uh, the Quran uh, has a verse which says uh, that for women uh, are, are rights equal to the responsibilities owing to them. Uh, in Surah 2, verse 228. Uh, Imam uh, Abu Jafar Tabari, in his commentary, his exegesis of the Quran, says that uh, this uh, verse should be understood in a way that uh, is free of internal contradiction. Uh, because the following from that says, and, and men have a degree over them. He said, you cannot take the two in isolation from each other, because then you'll end up in a contradiction. How can everything be even, Stephen, in the first phrase, and then in the second phrase, you have the men having one up over on the women. So when you take it all together, it must mean that women have equal rights uh, to, that, uh, to their responsibilities owing on them. And the men have a special, Darajah here is not like a chip on their shoulder, but a special responsibility towards women. And, and that's how he understands uh, the, the passage. If you understand it that way, then you see this uh, Surah 4, verse 34, which says, Arijalu qawamun ala nisa. That has to be much misunderstood. People think that that means that men have uh, full authority over women. 
And if we understand the whole Quran together, let one part uh, interpret another part, explain another part, then it doesn't seem to mean that. It means more something like what Abdul Harim has translated, uh, indicating uh, that uh, men have, uh, this the society is to make sure that men are protecting and maintaining the women. So we think of today's uh, rules against uh, deadbeat fathers to make sure that the men actually stay and look after their responsibilities to the household. It seems that this is what the Quran was speaking about in saying, Abrijal al Qawamun al Men, the, the community should make sure that the men are protecting and maintaining uh, the women. Uh, by virtue of what uh, of the fact that Allah has uh, given some more than some others. What is the fuddle here? If you go to the classical commentators, you will see a variety of, uh, uh, of suggestions of what, what makes the man so special, including the fact that the man has a beard and the woman doesn't have it. Uh, but we cannot uh, just you know, take everything from the classical commentators because they were sons of their time, just as we are sons of our own time. We should recognize our own proclivities and biases, but we should also recognize that they had theirs as well. But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us the intelligence uh, to uh, learn uh, that knowledge which was available and which we inherited from them, and also to observe much more than they might have observed. And uh, it's with all of that, the cumulative learning altogether, we need to go back to the Quran and ask what, pre what specifically is the Quran talking about. So what is the puzzle that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is talking about here? Two verses previously. Do not, let, do not desire that which Allah has given to some over some others. So what was the point of contention? What, what do people might argue about? This is Surah An-Nisa, you have to remember. What is Surah An-Nisa famous for? It's the rights that are spelled out. Verse number 11 and verse number 12 spells out the rights of inheritance. And in that society, it was obviously uh, justified uh, to give a double share of the inheritance to the men who were responsible generally for maintaining the women, whereas if a woman had uh, any wealth of her own, that was hers to keep. So the man was given a double share of inheritance, and the message of the Quran here is that you should not be jealous of that, just leave it as it is, because that is for a good reason. That is the fadl of Allah. The man was given the double share, and the woman is being told, okay, don't let this be a point of contention. And then two verses later, let the man maintain the woman out of this extra fuddle, this uh, bounty that Allah has given him. It's not that he has a beard and the woman has none. It's because he's been given some extra money and now that's not for him to keep. It is for him now to use in maintaining the, his children and his uh, women folk. So when things are seen then in that uh, broader perspective, when we let verse comment on, on verse, when we connect things in the Quran and draw the lines between dots, we see that the Quran actually was advancing uh, the status of women and their rights. We must remember that in ancient societies, women were part of the inheritance sometimes. They were handed on as the inheritance. In, in the Bible, for example, people might be surprised to learn that uh, there is, for example, uh, the Levitical uh, marriage, the Le Leverate marriage, which uh, basically stipulated that if a man marries a woman and he dies before having a child, his brother takes the wife so that she can have a child with the brother for the dead one. So, so the child will belong really to the dead one. Okay? So th and then, if that brother too dies without uh, fathering a child with her, then she can go on and on until you can have a situation which is described in the scriptures that there have been seven brothers all together. So in a way, she is locked in this uh, situation. Uh, whereas, of course, uh, the, the Islamic tradition uh, frees the women from some of the ancient uh, prescriptions and, uh, and, and, and rights. So, uh, if, if there is any uh, way in which uh, we have failed in our own way uh, to continue to advance uh, in the way that the Quran was already indicating, then that's our own fault. Because we have taken the prescription as though that's the final word on everything without seeing the direction in which these prescriptions are pointing. Because it's, sometimes, uh, you're working with a situation, you cannot change the entire situation, but you work with it and you improve it the best you can. But you're also pointing out in a general way that this is your attitude towards the subject. You are working for improvement in this area. 
So if we were good Muslims, we will continue to work for the improvements in this area. But we haven't. We just t have taken things the way they are. And sometimes we have uh, given more prescriptions in such a way that we have turned back the clock on, on the Quranic progress, either by giving religious rulings or by re-adopting some cultural practices which Islam uh, actually uh, were against. So the advances that the Quran was making, we have actually uh, stifled in, in our own way. So in sum, I hope that I have uh, covered all of the points that uh, you, you have um, indicated to me, but let me go back to that page and see if there's anything that I've missed, and I'll try to do that quickly before taking your questions. So oppression of women we dealt with, apostasy I didn't deal with, 9-11 is connected with jihad and the whole thing about violence, we did that thoroughly. Uh, polygamy I didn't have a chance to get into, uh, borrow from Christianity, yes we did that, spread by the sword, okay that's connected with jihad, let's leave that for the time being. Let me talk very quickly about apostasy, uh, because that can, can be quite quick. And traditionally, in, in, uh, in all of the four schools of Islamic thought, as uh, described by Muhammad al Awa in his book uh, on crime and punishments in, in the Islamic faith, uh, it was generally accepted that the apostate would be killed. But uh, al Awa, in analyzing the ahadith that deal with this, uh, has raised some interesting questions regarding it. First of all, there is no verse of the Quran that says that the apostate should be killed. On the other hand, the Quran seems to indicate that there were apostates in the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, right in Medina. And, and in that, if he was killing apostates, how would they survive? What do you think, for example, of the verse from uh, Surah Al Imran, which says that uh, uh, they, 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 some people are saying to each other, uh, uh, some are saying to each other, okay, believe, like pretend to believe in the Islamic message in the early part of the day, and then by the end of the day, just renege from it, so that the others will be put into doubt, so that they too will, will renege from the faith. So if people were applying this sort of strategy, right in Medina, where the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, lives, and where he's the virtual uh, uh, leader, and he has power uh, to execute anyone according to the known rules of his time. How, 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 would, how would they practice this strategy if he was killing people for apostasy? Obviously he wasn't. Obviously this is something that developed later and people attributed back to the Prophet peace be upon him. The attributions themselves which say that you should kill the person who reneges from his religion actually should be understood as complete narratives not only in part because it says man, but uh, uh, whoever uh, returns from his faith and he, he changes his community. It's not only that he leaves the faith, but he also leaves the community. What would be the problem then if somebody left the community? The army and the, uh, of the Muslims in the time of the Prophet peace be upon him was an ad hoc army. And probably it was the same on the other side as well. Now think of the present day situation where you have uh, specified army personnel. <laughs> what, what happens if one of your army personnel is seen uh, having close relations with people on the other side? His actions would be viewed with some suspicion because he knows the army secrets and we cannot allow him to go into bed with people of the other side to use an expression that people commonly use. Uh, in, in the time of the Prophet peace be upon him, every able-bodied Muslim man was a potential army person. He might be called into battle, he may volunteer himself for battle, he would know the military secrets, he knows the Prophet's strategies, his movements, his weaknesses, at least the weaknesses of the army. So if he not only changes his religion, but he abandons the community, that means he's departing with such sensitive information. He should not be allowed to depart, that may continue to be a source of danger uh, for the Muslims. So that seems to be the real point. Uh, about this sort of prescription, which came to be taken as a general rule and preserved in the classical textbooks as though, as though this is a religious ruling that the apostate should be killed. Otherwise, the Quran is quite clear. Allah <coughs> reveals the truth uh, and he does not uh, compel anyone to accept the truth. Like Raha 15, Surah 2, verse 256, the following verse, but, uh, that, that the, 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 that the truth has been uh, distinguished from the falsehood. So there's no need really to force anyone to become a Muslim or to stay a Muslim because the truth has been distinguished from the falsehood. Uh, whoever believes that's for his own good and whoever disbelieves that that's for his own good. 
Whoever wants, let him believe. Whoever wants, let them disbelieve. This is the general Quranic principle. In fact, the Quran asked the Prophet, peace be upon him. Are you going to force people so that they, they believe? He cannot do that. The, the rhetorical question deserves here the no answer. No, I'm not going to uh, do that. Last alayhim people cite him. This is a general principle in, in the Islamic faith. Address to the Prophet, peace be upon him. You are not a supervisor over people. Yeah, you, you only to deliver the message. The messenger's responsibility is only to deliver the, the message. So this is very clear. Uh, so we should not um, insist that the apostate should be killed. Uh, rather, we feel that the message of Islam has to be delivered. And once it is delivered, uh, and with clarity and persuasiveness, more and more people will enter it into Islam. And we won't have to worry about the few who apostatize. Because uh, apostates, apostates today do not pose any danger to the Islamic message or even to the safety of Muslims. Uh, if ordinary people now associate with people from another uh, faith or another country even, you can have uh, here in uh, the same university, German students, uh, Russian students, whatever. Uh, there's no harm, people associating with each other. But uh, the harm then at the time in, of the Prophet, peace be upon him, was that the ordinary Muslims were also potential soldiers or actual soldiers uh, for the Muslim community. <coughs> what about polygamy? Uh, very quickly, we can say that uh, polygamy actually was practiced in ancient times, uh, and this was known to be the general rule. Biologists <coughs> actually say that uh, men have the uh, proclivity to spread their genes around, and uh, we are descendants of those men who had such proclivity. Uh, so I'm not giving you an excuse for this, but uh, I'm just telling you that's what biologists say. Uh, so when a man desires more than one woman, uh, actually he's just simply living out his uh, biological instincts. Uh, so, so that was natural, and men did in fact marry many women, sometimes without uh, limit. We read in the Bible, for example, that many of the famous figures had many wives. Jacob, who is uh, renamed Israel, and who is the father of the Israelites, uh, and, and after whose name we have the state of Israel name, and Jacob had four women. Uh, he married uh, uh, Rachel, uh, and then he married Rachel's sister, Leah, uh, and then each one, Rachel and, and Leah, uh, had a concubine each, so they gave their, their handmaids to Jacob. Uh, so now he had four women. And through these four women, he, gave, uh, he fathered the 12 sons who became the heads of the 12 tribes of Israel. So this is famous. Jacob is a celebrated person with four wives, two sisters and their concubines together. So they had uh, practices and customs in the ancient times which might be difficult to understand now. But they had their own reasons for, for having this. Some of them might be good reasons, some might be bad reasons from our perspective. But uh, you, you can't quarrel with the history. That's what is known to have happened. Uh, the Prophet Sulaiman, uh, who is known as King Solomon in the Bible, and the author of the Proverbs and some other writings which are said to be sacred scripture inspired by God, uh, according to the Book of Kings, had 700 wives and 300 concubines. So that's a thousand. Some of you brothers want to go to paradise to get 72 or something. But he had seven, a, a, a thousand. Uh, the number obviously was and it must have been exaggerated. Uh, a hadith uh, mentions um, uh, in, in a few varieties 70 or 90 or 99 or something uh, as his number of wives. But nevertheless, you can see that these men had large numbers of wives. This was very common in, in those times. When Islam came to be revealed, that, that was the same a situation in which people did have many wives. There are some reports saying that a certain Gailan in Damascus, for example, had eight wives. And when he embraced Islam, the Prophet, peace be upon him, advised him to keep four and, and divorce the rest. Regardless of the authenticity of this particular narrative, it, it is known that at the time, people did have uh, multiple wives. So what was the Quran doing then? To understand what, what the Quran's message is, we should distinguish between that which is uh, natural to the time and that which is special to the Quran. So uh, the, uh, this is a principle that uh, Bilal Phillips has uh, enunciated in the introduction to his Tafsir Surah al Fajrat. Uh, but uh, the principle is, uh, is seldom evoked and, and hardly really uh, made use of. Uh, the, the principle is that there is Sunnah Tabi'iyah and Sunnah Tashri'iyah. There is that which the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, did by virtue of the fact of the person he was living in the time and place that he was. And then there is the Sunnah that he uh, did, his actions that demonstrate what was the Islamic prescription regarding a certain issue. What is the Islamic plan here? So the two are different, and we have to make that distinction. 
But in the early centuries of Islam, the scholars did not make this distinction enough. Why? Because uh, day after day, life continued as usual. The following generation was just like the previous one, and there was hardly anything new under the sun. So they, they didn't have to make that distinction. We have to make that distinction now because so much has changed since the time of the Prophet Muhammad, peace be upon him, to now. So we have to go back and look at what he was doing and look at what the Quran was saying and ask how much of that is due to the time and place and how much of that is due to the everlasting teachings and principles of, of Islam. So we already see that uh, marrying multiple wives, this was very common. So that's not so what the Quran is doing. The Quran is now commenting on that situation and showing what you should do now. So find out what the Quran is trying to say. Surah 4, verse number 3, according to Yusuf Ali in his, uh, comment, in his translation and commentary, was revealed soon after the battle of Uhud. We mentioned Badr and then Uhud. In Uhud, many of the Muslim soldiers died, some 70 shuhada at that time. And they're buried at Uhud when we go to make the Hajj uh, pilgrimage to visit Medina. The taxi drivers are calling out, ziyara, ziyara. Then you take a taxi ride, you can go to Uhud and make dua for uh, the uh, slain shuhada from Uhud. But now we can make du'a for them. But what was to be done with their widows and orphans? That's a reality. Now, nowadays, you have a welfare situation set up, and you have a problem, I'm reading in your local newspapers, uh, about uh, the teenage pregnancies. So uh, the, the social, the social um, uh, welfare programs have to come into place to, to look after these uh, persons. But in, in a pre-welfare society, in a budding, nascent uh, society as the Muslims were, having abandoned their homes and properties uh, because of the new faith, because of the persecution they faced, now they set up a new society. They don't have the welfare system in place. And even if they did, you can only give money through the welfare system. What about uh, the fatherly figure in the house uh, having some control on the children and uh, giving them uh, a big mentoring for them and uh, being the big buddy for them? So what was to be done? The Quran in Surah 4, verse number 3 is simply saying, If you fear that you will not do justice to the orphans, then marry the women who are suitable for you in twos and threes and fours. Uh, if you fear that you will not do justice even in that, then stick with one or whatever your right hands possess. That is more suitable uh, so that you do not uh, swerve from that which is right, or swerve from justice. Now, if you think about it, you see that the, the idea of justice is repeated three times in that uh, verse. So the verse really is about justice. The verse is not about marrying multiple women. The verse is about achieving justice. And the problem for justice in that situation is that you have a whole lot of widows and orphans. So if, as a society, you leave that situation as it is without doing something, you're doing injustice. So the, the, the verse says, if you fear that you're not doing justice, especially to the orphans, then marry the women who are suitable for you in twos and threes and fours. Because by doing that, you'll take care of the widows, you'll take care of the orphans as well. But of course, a person can stretch himself out too thinly. And he might not do justice even with his good intentions. He wants to marry four, but he may not do justice. And if the malaf kadilu pawahe, then in that case you just stick with one because you may not do justice by marrying the multiple. Dalika adna that taulu. That is most suitable so that you do not swerve from justice. So it, again, it's all about justice and about achieving uh, what is right and wholesome for that society. Uh, we cannot then take that and say, okay, so this becomes a general rule for all times and all places, regardless of circumstances. Uh, yes, if such circumstances uh, should arise, which make this institution suitable for promoting what is good in the society, then yes. If you have a situation with uh, many uh, <laughs> single mothers uh, who have children to take care of and they're struggling, they can't, cannot make ends meet, and nobody comes to the rescue of these individuals, and if a sister says to her husband, you know, honey, look at those, that uh, sister is suffering, uh, let, let's take her into our home and, and let her be a wife along with me. And, and her children be your children, and my children as well, right? and we'll take care of them. Uh, now that, that's something beautiful. I, I don't think anyone would argue with that. 
but, but people uh, fear the other sort of situation. I don't know if you have it here, but I noticed it in Canada. You know, a, a brother marries uh, a woman and he doesn't go through the legal routine, so he just does a little decon on the side. And uh, he, then he has children with her. And then she receives a welfare check, and the more children, the more you receive. So he has a few kids with her, and he marries another one in a similar way, and he gets a welfare check there as well. So he goes from one home to another, which is not his home. You know, the, the apartments are rented uh, by the sisters who are getting this uh, reasonable income uh, through the social security system. And he doesn't have to work outside of the bedroom. He just goes from one apartment to another, makes more children, and uh, he enjoys himself. Is this really Islam? Is that what the Quranic verse is talking about? Or the Quranic verse is talking about a very different situation? So we can see that there are some situations which uh, you know, people might uh, misinterpret the verse and, and apply it to, to those situations. And we can see that there are some real situations uh, to which uh, the verse actually provides uh, a reasonable solution. So I leave it at that. Uh, then I've said uh, quite enough, and I know that you have obligations, other things to do. Uh, I'd, I'd like to hear any questions that you have, if the master ceremonies will permit us to go on. Otherwise, uh, I'll be speaking uh, again later on tonight. So I would invite you to come back tonight, and, and let's uh, deal with whatever questions remain, as much as the time will permit. Yeah, I think we'll have a very brief uh, Q and A session. Um, as, as I said earlier, I'd like to throw it to the non Muslims. So if they have any questions, uh, please ask. Okay. Yeah. Sure. Yeah, and then we can okay. talk informally if you. If you okay, I think we'll end at this and then. Yeah, please help us out to the, uh, the lunch. Thank you.